Brian Howell here with Pro Video Coalition. I'm talking to James. We're in Nashville in my backyard and we have a delicious set of prime lenses from Zeiss. Mm -hmm. Now, Twitter, I was on Twitter and someone asked me about the B4 Digi Primes from Zeiss. Now, it's not, not just one, but I had a couple people. They're very attractive lens. Tell me a little bit about the history. It's, it's taken too long for people to recognize that these are lenses they should consider using. Um, these lenses came out in the early you know, aughts, the 2000s, when digital cinema, they'd had trouble getting the chips larger. So you had uh, the Sony F23, you had the um, Viper cam. The and, Bear you know, cam, Bear, even. Yeah, yeah, you had films, and yeah, and had, like the F900 and whatnot. You had films, actual, you know, yeah, motion picture. Benjamin picture. Button, uh, Frozen River, I mean, um, Big collateral. Movies. Big I movies mean, that yeah. were being shot on Prism two thirds sensor. And, and what describe Prism? That's a three C C D. What's right. that mean? So <laughs> these were the old days. You had cameras that had a, a genuine optical prism that would split uh, the colors onto three separate um, three separate angles and the three so separate like parts of the prism would be red, green, mm -hmm. and blue. And the sensors didn't, today's Bayer sensors, they have these little micro filters to split out and only receive one color spectrum per photosite. Well, with a prism, you don't do that. You just put a color filter on each of the three sides of the prism and the colors get, you only receive one color per side of it. So these are B4, which means two thirds mm -hmm. sensor. Yes. Um, but there's still Zeiss class. It's the same bayonet mount that you see in, in many news cameras. Yeah. Um, most news cameras are, are two thirds sensor. Some are now uh, on a half inch, but they're on that two thirds format with this bayonet mount. And yet they basically were like, let's take that same format and put digital cinema grade sensors into them. So you had, you know, the Sony F23 coming out with a price tag probably around $400,000. Yeah, now you can buy out. it for like, Four I, grand, maybe the whole kit. Even well, four grand for the whole kit, maybe. Yeah, uh, fifteen hundred. I've seen them as low as just for the body on on eBay. And so, incredible camera, but it big and bulky for today. Yes. Well, so these lenses, the, the Zeiss quality, the sharp. You can see this right here. You can see you get your rings. You have everything you need for cinema. It is that build. In terms of build quality, we're talking about something on par with Master Primes, and if not, with Ultra Primes. And so at one point in time, I owned Ultra Primes, and I found these to be the same level, if not better, than the Ultra Primes that I owned. And, and fundamentally, it's just, it's a smaller optical standard. So if anything, these had to, the glass had to be to a higher standard than it was with Ultra Primes or Master Primes, because there's less glass to work with. The so I tested these. Mm -hmm. you know, what do you think? Well, I, they're sharp. I saw zero chromatic aberration. And that was what everyone expected to see because of the splitting, the 3 CCD, yeah. the prism. You think these lenses are made exactly for that split. They are. And on the CMOS sensor, and specifically the news camera, which is our two shot right here. Right. Um, that's uh, what it, one of the cameras I tested them on. I, I saw no, no problem. And if anything, it should actually be the most perfect on the news camera that actually is, if it's still using a prism. I don't no, know if the No, no, the is. prism's okay. gone and come and gone. Other yeah. than like a single lens camera maybe. Mm -hmm. Some of those still use them. Uh, Sony I don't think does. Uh, I think Panasonic's moved away from them. They're all going to the CMOT. So reading fast enough to... So the thing with the prism is that in theory, your distances are slightly different. And so the, the high grade glass for a prism camera was built to basically adapt for that, to split the wavelengths just right. And so in theory on a, on a single sensor, you might have a little splitting on yeah. something that's built for a prism. I'm really glad to see that you didn't have an issue with that. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm no lens expert. Mm -hmm. I don't pretend to be a lens expert. I just took these two uh, contrast visuals, Nathan Thompson over there. And, uh, what did Nathan think? Well, Nathan was in the town. Okay, okay. Uh, Loki and Jay were there, <laughs> and uh, Jay was there with, with me the whole time, and he's really impressed with that the close focus. The close focus the is 20 incredible. inches from the not from the front of the lens, 20 in, in, inches from the yeah. sensor, um, and then the the five, which isn't even the widest in the full set. Mm -hmm. There's a three. Yeah, I mean, I, my set personally, I got these for $9,500, and this was the set that was available and to how me. How many lenses do you have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lenses. Eight, eight lenses plus, you know, the case and the uh, back focus tool. And that's just incredible because you can't buy DSLR glass for $1,000 a lens across the range. Yes, yeah, so these, 
you know, some people look at this, I had this happen again on Twitter, they saw the five millimeter and they're like, wow, how wide is that? Mm -hmm. Like, well, obviously on a two thirds inch sensor, it's, yeah. it's wide, but it's not, it's not I mean, it's, it's very wide, but it's not like 180 degree view. You can't think in terms of a full frame or an ASPC type sensor. No, these, um, these were, it's a full range, mm -hmm. 70 being very, very long, but not news came along. Like no, a, I mean, it's not, yeah. But here's the thing. These are, this is a 1 1.9, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6. And the thing is, if you're T -stops using- T-stops across the board, other than the watt. If you're using a PL adapter, which is a thing, you can get a PL adapter with glass in it uh, to basically fit these to your modern 35 millimeter type cameras. Practically speaking, you're gonna have a loss reduction because it's kind of the opposite of one of the speed boosters because of the size. But practically speaking, you're kind of gonna be close to still a T4 by the t in, in terms of ultimate light that you receive yeah. by the time of that light reduction. So, so. Wh why should someone shoot? I mean, I know why. I tested these lenses. Mm -hmm. They're very sharp. Um, the wide on a new style camera, that's like the Sony yeah. 400 we have right here, it was very much gave me a feel of like a Terrence Malick Tree of Life feel. If the camera's on a steady cam, low, I feel like the flare was very similar to Master Primes. And the, uh, the field of view, and the depth of field was very similar to that Brad Pitt, Terrence Malick movie. So we were talking about this uh, off camera before, you know, when we started in the business, uh, there was not, film and video were very separate things. Yes. And you had the ground glass adapters were kind of this first step before the Canon 5D uh, into the world. Let's not even try to remember those, <laughs> I hated those. But fundamentally, uh, depth bokeh was so hard to achieve that it made you look like a filmmaker if you could have bokeh. Yes. And today, bokeh is cheap you can get the cheapest DSLRs and you can have beautiful bokeh. Yeah. And so now I think the challenge with filmmaking is to look at what you can do with the frame and that includes actually showing us more of the frame. And when you're in focus, you can now work on your lighting, yes. your composition, how you shape that light, you can work on your framing. So and the thing I would say is not everything needs to be out of focus. No, We don't absolutely. need eyelash, depth of field. If you're shooting and I'm working on a story where it would be a lot of landscapes, mm -hmm. you know, I might want a very deep, I uh, depth of field. I want to. I might want to show, like the the Grand Canyon or New Mexico or Colorado or Patagonia. Yeah, where there's a great on Netflix has a great series. And you're not shooting at T two eight, you know, or T one point six. You're probably shooting at T eight to sixteen. But on these, you could. <laughs> you could. <laughs> you could. <laughs> you could. Now, now these are full. These are cinema lenses, but they're slightly different. They have this back focus adjustment. You can see here this little knob, right there. And you can see the, the little, you know, if I take the tap top off, you can see the little dial here. This is because B4 lenses need an adjustment for, between cameras. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. So that's, it's actually partially a function just of, of the bayonet mount and of temperature. And the fact is, is that you have metal here and metal, you know, it contracts it, um, it widens and it tightens and the distance, the flange distance can change. Uh, over the course of a shoot and moving from you know being inside during winter to being actually out there in the cold and so back focus was the practical way on news cameras to basically you know on those style bayonet mount cameras to adjust for that um and the well, fact we have a whole they have the whole it comes yeah. with the whole heat device here so i mean there are plenty of ways to get your back focus right but they they basically made it super easy with this this specific tool that came with these lenses that was designed to make it very easy to get your back focus correct focus correct um, and basically you just put the lens, uh, design wise, what you would do is you put the lens straight into here and you've got it mounted onto the camera and it fits in correctly. And then you're able to, uh, go ahead and there's a light in there. I don't know if you shot footage of how this functions. Well, I did not, but I got pictures, <laughs> but you have a light here and you're able to see a simian star. Yes. In the inside. And so you basically get that into focus see. correctly by adjusting the back focus and you are then correctly, uh, you know, focused. And you would use that for, um, if you would take the set out, you would, you'd, for the most part, test. You'd get your back focus set before going out in the field, making some minor adjustments if need be, or che checking the lens every time you took it off. But for the most part, I've noticed, once you have it set, you're kind of set per camera. I think the big thing is going to be if you have a temperature change, if you move inside to outside, you change yeah, uh, locations. like going out down Louisiana or even here in Nashville in the summer, it's 100 degrees outside, you go inside at 72, it's yeah. high humidity, you're gonna fog, 
and you're, it's going to change your metal is going to shrink and contract at different speeds. And if you're using these in the environment they were intended for, which is like a movie production set where you actually have an assistant camera, you have somebody you know helping you with this. This back focus step would be something the AC would be taking care of for the yes. camera operator or the DP, and they'd be doing it between shots. Now, I think this is an interesting point you bring up here. These are cinema lenses. Yes. These are not easy to shoot as a one-man band. I mean, they Without are a little a bulkier follow focus and heavier. System. The other trade-off, though, is with DSLR-style lenses, you frequently have sets, even like the Zeiss ZF series, you have uh, different distances on where the rings are and positioning. Yes. And if you've ever had the pleasure of working with something like Ultra Primes or Cooks or something, you'll notice that except for maybe extreme lenses on the very wide side or the very telephoto side, uh, everything is going to, within a specific series and set, it's going to have matching uh, ring distances between where your iris is and where your focus is. And it's going to have a matching uh, diameter for the front so that a matte box can be correctly attached. And if you've had that pleasure, you're going to know that basically it speeds things up dramatically on set yeah. uh, when everything is basically the standardized. You can slap the matte box back on correctly quickly. You can uh, basically get your follow focus back aligned correctly. That saves you so much time on set. Yeah, I would say if you're going to use these lenses, you need like a Nucleus M or a Red Rock Micro, something to roll your focus with your finger because if you're trying to roll your focus with your hand, yeah. like on your own, you're, they're you're long gonna, throws. You know, they're 300 degrees. Yeah, I mean that's that's the they're they're incredibly long throws on the focus here. So um, you're just you're gonna keep going yeah. and going and going. Yeah. So and this going, is this is that know. the closest, which is like looks like 19 inches, and you can see me just go 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 over here too. I mean that's. It's incredible, there. you know, and that allows you that's to a, get very accurate. That's almost a 320, 340 degree focus pull. Yeah, but that allows you to get very accurate focus, whereas with DSLR lenses, you're often fighting to get specific enough focus. Now, I think the highlight to me of this lens, other than this, the 5, the 10, because mm -hmm. it's T1.6, is really an interesting lens to shoot yeah. with. You get some really interesting view, field of views, but this beauty... It's the gorgeous, isn't 70. it? That so close focus. The CF, you can see, yeah. is close focus. That's 20 inches from here to here. And if I recall uh, correctly, I think there is a 70 that's not CF. And so if you're shopping, make sure that you get the one that is close focus. Yeah, so I was able to shoot with something that close right. with this lens. So if you know the... Um, the lens chart everyone has, the larger 30 by 20 mm -hmm. um, Snyder or whatever, it has this middle section that is a CF, and CF, it has the cross and the two H's, the resolution chart. You can get just the X in field with the camera that far away. It's amazing. And that, to me, this is a beauty. I think they would get like Lego figures. Yeah. Like just the head. Just yeah, the head of the Lego figure. This is such a unique focus. focus, unique lens that if I was doing, I could have shot a whole movie or whatever, I needed macro or close-up intros, I would probably dive into one of these lenses to give myself something different to look at. But this is also gorgeous just for a portrait at, yes. at the distance oh, yeah. that you would actually pull a portrait. And you're, I, as I recall, you're going to get some bokeh on that if you're wide open. With the oh, portrait. wide open, yeah. You're yeah. going to, anything above the 20, yeah. I think you're going to get some really interesting bokeh. 14, 10, 7, Not five, designed for it. <laughs> three, you're going that wide Zeiss look. I mean, and these lenses flare a little bit. They have a really beautiful star pattern when it comes to the sun or any highlight. Like, it's a 22-point star. Uh, but it's also a little bit of ghosting, which is if you want some of that flare, it's beautiful. All right. I think we've, we've talked about these lenses. Yeah. It's a beautiful lenses. Thank you for letting me try them out. No, thank you for, for actually, you know, calling me up and saying, hey, I want to check these out because I really feel like these lenses have been neglected. The very fact that I was able to buy this set for 9500 is is just insane because you couldn't manufacture anything close to this quality for that cost. No, this, this I would know. say this is top tier glass. Um, and, you know, if you had an Ursa broadcast and you were looking to shoot a, a movie with it or, or you wanted to have it tool on your belt do something different other than a zoom like on this lens which has a lot of chromatic yeah. aberration a lot of you know blurring and the edges wide open when this these do not these give you some of the more cinema like well and the other thing is like frankly there have been uh 
you know, companies even like Fred that have offered cropped B4, you know, modes or being able to pull out of the center for a long time. And as we get uh, to where, and some of the camera makers, they have like fast motion, but only using the center crop, right? Yeah. So particularly as we're jumping to 6K and 8K, on a, on a 35 sensor, there's no reason you wouldn't be able to do a great pullout in 1080 or even you know 4K. Oh, we have the pocket on, on right these. here, right? It's pocket 4K. They now have a super 16 inch millimeter crop. Yeah, which is very close to two thirds. I bet you you would have, I bet I, if you had just a manual mount, you could adjust the B4 from the micro four thirds. I think most of these lenses would cover it perfectly. Yeah, and certainly in a music video, you'd be able to do very creative things even if they didn't. Yeah, and then, then you have a very sharp lens, a very, you know, sharp camera. I think, uh, you know, you have a good package there. Yeah, well, thanks thank for you. checking it out. Thank you. Thank you for letting me test them.